have heard of us at all. <gasps> wow! Okay. Oh, great. Well, um, I think we were, uh, I'm here to do a, a presentation to you about our work, kind of a, a, his, a historical kind of overview of what we've been doing and how we got to where we are now. Um, I'm also going to be doing a, a solo uh, sound noise performance thingy tomorrow at uh, 4 30 in the afternoon. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think that we fit into the conference here because our work is a, 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 a technological, artistic response to all these developments in technology and media that create this new culture and world we live in, and then we end up using some of that new technology to make stuff about the stuff that we're reacting to. And of course, end up bumping into things like copyright law and stuff, but I'll get to that later. Um, the kind of stuff that Negative Link has been doing for 32 years, we're a collective uh, of, uh, and it's still the same guys, believe it or not. Never expected we would still be together uh, uh, after all these years. And nowadays, even though the kind of work we do is just as illegal as it ever was, we seem to have uh, achieved some weird kind of aura of respectability, which I don't quite understand. But um, um, I've even been asked to do things like speak in Capitol Hill. I've spoken to the staff of senators and congressmen and all kinds of crazy stuff like that um, to try and say that there really are some in new directions that culture is going in that we need to allow it to go in. That we really can't have these, these uh, um, corporate moneyed interests calling all the shots the way they have it. It's really not such a good idea. I'm sure you all know this. Um, the kind of work that Negative Land did, and I'm going to be showing you examples of this throughout my presentation. Um, uh, I don't personally feel really as transgressive anymore. I think it, there was an era where it really truly once was. I think taking things uh, from the mass media around you, the corporate culture, the pop cultural world, and cutting them up and reusing them, uh, I really feel there was an era where it really felt like an edgy, transgressive thing to do. Um, I think now that collage has passed over into uh, uh, Mainstream uh, as a mainstream artistic practice, and you know, just teenage kids just grab things and make funny YouTube videos out of stuff that they took off, of, you know, YouTube or whatever. Um, so uh, things have really, really, really changed. The laws haven't changed, but the the, the pra cultural practices have, and that's how things always change, right? We always see that the, there's always a grassroots, bottom-up kind of kind of effort to change anything, and, and with laws and society uh, and cultural things. Um, uh, if you look at uh, uh, women voting, civil rights issues, slavery, all of those things, you have generations of people um, struggling, and it's always power, the top-down you know, parts of power. They're always the last to finally concede. Um, if you look at it in those terms, the shifts we're seeing happen around uh, reuse of, of intellectual property are, in fact, historically happening really, really fast, uh, I think. Well, when Negative Land started out, um, we loved making funny noises and strange sounds. We liked pop songs, and we just loved the world around us, the, the noises and things that were found in our environment. Well, I'm a middle-class suburban kid, so my environment was the sprinklers oscillating, you know, oscillating in the yard, my parents in the kitchen baking, the dog barking, the television set on, all four channels of it. Um, and so those things just very naturally made its way into Negative Land's work. Uh, there was something really appealing about taking things out of their intended uh, uh, context and ripping them out and reusing them in a new way. There was something about that. As I said, I don't feel like this is a, you know, a transgressive thing anymore, but, but 32 years ago, this, there was something about that that just felt very, very exciting and new and different. And what we very quickly discovered was something that I think uh, there's plenty of people in the audience tonight who are old enough to know what reel-to-reel -reel, uh, recording tape is, right? Yes? Raise your hand. <laughs> yes! Well, and razor blades. And you, um, you can take that recording tape and you can take your razor blade and you can cut the tape up and rearrange it and loop it one end to the other. And, and uh, we discovered it, you know, this at the age of 16 or 17, this is a revelation. My God, sound can be plastic, and you can manipulate it. And of course, now you can do this, you know, in two seconds with the computer. I um, mean, the commands cut and paste are in the computer. And in fact, I feel like the computer was just a technology that just screamed out 
the, the need to appropriate with it, to, to collage, to cut up, to mash up. I mean, it's just built to do it, right? Um, but before the term sampling existed, before there was digital ways to do this, we were doing all this with analog cut up. And not worrying about who owned what we used, because who would care about what we were doing? We just liked, the, as I said, the, the, the repurposing of things was somehow just very, very exciting for us to do. So I'm going to go to a short clip to show you an example of some of our earlier work. And all of the films I'm going to show you today, they're not made when the audio was made. The, these are actually, all the films are us going back into our old uh, projects and reusing our own, approaching our own work as if it was found material and collaborating with new uh, contemporary experimental filmmakers to make uh, different short films. And there's a lot more that I'm going to show you um, uh, today. But this first piece is called Truth in Advertising, and we took a call in to a talk radio show. Of course, this was all done, the, analog, the uh, audio was done with razor blades. And um, it's a call into a talk radio show, and every time the host wants to hang up on the caller, we could edit it so that if the next caller he goes to is the caller he was just talking to. You know, we just, he gets caught in some funny kind of loop. And by repetition of phrases and kind of teasing out some different kind of meanings in the language, we were able to kind of get at something that I think is an interesting subject for collage in, in a piece of, uh, of uh, audio and film. So this is called Truth in Advertising, and it was made in collaboration with the filmmaker James Towning from Columbus, Ohio. This is Pennywise. Joan, you're next. This is Sue. Oh, hi, Sue. How can I help? Jim, I really have a problem with impulse buying. I never oh. have money left for anything. Oh, why? Jim, I really have a buying impulse problem well, with buying, okay. buying anything, anything, anything. Well, wait a minute. Go ahead and use some of that money there. Bring some happiness. Jim, I really have a problem. Jim, I never have money left for impulse buying. A lot of people have that problem. Pay cash. Good idea. I feel we really need to buy right away. After all, money is only paper and metal until you put it to use. I never money. have money left. But you already decided to buy. Impulse, impulse. I really think it'll help. Good idea. Oh, thanks. Okay, let's go to line four. This is Pennywise. I'm Jim Phillips, and your name is... Bob. Hi, Bob. What can I do for you? I get confused by all the claims made in commercials. Oh, this is Pennywise. Line six. You're on. And your name is... Bob. Caller number five. We're on the air with Pennywise. I'm Jim Phillips. I get confused by all the claims made in commercials. Oh, let's go to line seven on Pennywise. Hi, I'm Jim Phillips. Bob. Commercials. Oh, oh. I get confused by all the claims made in commercials. Oh, well, listen... I think your first responsibility is to yourself and your family. The what? Thanks for the call. Hello, come on Pennywise with Jim Phillips, and you are... Bob. Okay, let's go to line four. This is Pennywise. I'm Jim Phillips, and your name is... Bob. Oh. Commercials. Hello, caller? I get confused by all the claims made in commercials. Oh. And your name is... Bob. 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 Hi, Bob. What can I do for you? The what? Go ahead. I get confused by all the claims made in commercials. Hmm, you sound frustrated. It's because I am. Well... My kids and I, for example, love to build things with scrap lumber. The what? All right. Thanks for the call, Carl. Bob. Oh, this is Pennywise. Line six. You on? Bob. Yeah, Barb. Bob. Go ahead. The claims made in commercials. Oh. I get confused. Why? I get commercials confused. <laughs> you can imagine. The what? Well, many religious people follow the biblical plan of tithing. You may want to visit with your clergy about it, but of course... The what? The what? Commercials. Commercials. I get confused by all the claims. And your name is... Bob. Oh, that's a tough one. A lot of people have that problem. The what? Truth in advertising. I get confused. Well, advertising, though, can be a really good source of information because of the truth in advertising policy. The what? Because of the truth in advertising policy. The what? Truth in advertising. The what? Truth in advertising. Truth in advertising. You see, the law requires advertisers to tell the truth. The what? The truth. The truth. To tell the truth. Truth in advertising. Good point. Oh, so listen carefully to the wording of it, ad. The truth in advertising. The what? Well, then you have to decide if honesty goes both ways, right? After all, so this is Pennywise. You're on the air. Hi, Bob. What can I do for you? Yeah, Jim, this is Charlie. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got a moral question for you. The what? Well, wait a minute. Thanks for the call, Bob. This is Charlie. I've got a moral question for you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a matter for your own conscience, Charlie. I figured you'd say something like that. <laughs> all right. Why don't you give it a try this year? Okay. But don't never catch it. Well, thanks for calling, Charlie. Thanks. This is Pennywise. Line six. You're on. Yeah, Jim, this is Charlie.
Um, a question that I get asked a lot of times about our work for people who have followed is where, you know, where do you find all this stuff? And there's no, you know, easy trick to it. Uh, I guess nowadays, of course, you can do things like uh, search, search on the internet with tags attached to it and stuff. But for much of our career, it's just been spending, un, you know, un, unhealthily, unhealthy amounts of time in record stores and listening to radio and watching TV and just recording everything. And you, you just have to get tons and tons of material to which you then find the little gems here and there to pick out. And um, the other place that we end up with a lot incredible uh, resource uh, is our weekly radio show. We've had a radio show on since 1981 called Over the Edge. It's on KPFA in Berkeley uh, at midnight. And um, it's a live cut-up collage radio show. Very, very, very live, very cut-up. And we use a lot of radio station cart machines, which is a dead, now a dead technology, but it allows you to do some really interesting live tape cut-up in a way that would be pretty hard to do with a computer. Um, and uh, every week we pick a theme. So the show might be around, about advertising, or the moon, or dirt, or fire, or, or copyright, or... Uh, um, and. Um, we collect all the material, we bring stuff in, we write scripts, we have characters, we bring in songs, we find anything related to the theme, and we do this improvised mix for three hours. And telephone callers can call in and contribute in any way they want. If we just think they're uninteresting, we just hang up on them. But uh, it's been on for so long that people know that they can call up and contribute with their own noises, sounds, um, audio things that relate to the, the concept that week. And um, uh, one of the subjects we've done quite a few episodes on over the years is, is uh, you know, the, the ever-popular uh, topic of guns. And um, the radio show can act as a kind of a laboratory for us to try out new ideas and, see, and end up realizing that that has potential to make a finished studio recording project out to release. And so uh, we ended up deciding that there was enough good material here related to guns that we ended up making a project which we called Guns. And, um, uh, ended up making this uh, an audio track and collaborated many years later with a filmmaker from uh, Chicago named Peter Neville to make uh, this piece, which I'll show you, it's called Guns. <laughs> we weren't being too imaginative on the titling of that, I, I must say. Um, but this for me, I actually like this better as a video than I do as just audio, and I think that the video added a whole lot of uh, uh, really nice layers uh, to, of meaning to the whole thing. And I think that our earliest collage was really pretty pure surreal data, just goofy weirdness. But over the years, we started realizing that you really could use collage to talk about things. You could use this mass, the mass media, to talk about the mass media. You could use, you know, information, uh, corp uh, uh, corporate information uh, technology uh, materials to talk about the very things you were appropriating. And that's why I think for us, uh, collage has remained incredibly interesting over all these years. We do film collage. We just, we actually have an art show we just put op that opened in Los Angeles just last week at a, a gallery in LA called La Luz de Azus. And we've, in the last five years, we've started exhibiting our, our visual art, which interestingly enough also is all, ends up being collage as well. Um, not by intention, but it just seems, we just all seem to be a bunch of guys who just really love to find things and if any of you do a collage, you know that you start to just develop this, this sort of sixth sense of being able to look at a thing and, or hear a thing, see a thing, and, and say, oh, I know what you could do with that, you know, instead of what it is right now. And, and it's almost like an alchemical transformation moment that happens when you do that kind of thing. And so anyway, let's know this next piece is a little longer. Uh, Dominic is doing the sound there. This is about eight minutes. And uh, I, again, this is called uh, Guns. And we composed the music. Didn't steal it. Guns. Well done. 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 Well
Gosh, what a sight. Stay. Let's get out of here. Don't move for that door, either of you. That's the cock's voice. Where is it? I don't know. I can't see nothing. You don't have to see me. I can sit on you two and have a little talk. Just sit back and wait. Stacey and I can wait as long as you can. We can't stop. Can't we stay? We can't stop. I got your harmonica, Jake. Might as well have a little music while we're waiting. Harmonica? We can't stop. Oh, sure thing, Bill. Something happened. Quaker Puff Rice Sparkies and Quaker Puff Wheat Sparkies. Those delicious, nutritious breakfast cereals shot from guns. <laughs> Guns. We can't stop. Get up in there. Up. We'll just sit back and wait. First and fourth, gigantic grains of goodness. They want shooting, we give them their money's worth. Come on. We'll just sit back and wait. Tasty super Guess you can start on the harmonica now, Jingle. All right. Better put that fancy gun in your hand. You might need it. All right. I'll take my gun. Now we're going to have that talk. No money. See in this world.
going on anyway? Hickok, Jingle, Sourdough, all of them vanishing into thin air. There's something downright weird about this whole thing. And, uh, yeah, that's an older piece from the, I guess, <clears throat> early 90s of ours. Um, well, I mentioned earlier about being inspired by what we find, and I, and I think that's, uh, um, that's a, it's an important point to make because we never set out, we don't ever pick a subject and say, well, let's find things that support this idea or that. Uh, it's, it's always the other way around where you just bump into something and you get so excited by it that you, you want to make something out of it. And a, a really great example of that is this next story I'll tell you which leads into some very interesting adventures for Negative Land. Um, uh, founding, one of our other founding members, Richard Lyons, was at a thrift store and he found a record album that was called If Footmen Tire You, What Will Horses Do? And this was a record by the Reverend S.S.W. S. W. Perkel from Louisiana, came out in 1971. And the Reverend was, it was a sermon it's at, where he was talking about um, how the communists were clearly about to take over the United States if we didn't do any, something now and they were going to put us all into these concentration camps and they were going to, they were going to turn us into communists by, by broadcasting over a loudspeaker 17 hours a day the phrase, Christianity is stupid, communism is good, give up, give up, give up. Now, that's pretty interesting to take out of context from a Christian preacher, but what was really great and inspiring was it wasn't just what he was saying, it was how he said it. And he said, Christianity is stupid, Christianity is stupid, communism is good, give up, give up, give up. He's obviously the vocalist of a song, right? Um, so we, we used our razor blades and dubbed the record to tape and cut that out. And he was talking about how we were all going to be brainwashed. So we decided to compose some kind of heavy, leaden, dirge-like rock thing that sound, felt to us like brainwash music. And we ended up making a, um, uh, a piece of music with the, the reverend as the vocalist, um, which we, another one of our rather unimaginative titles, we ended up calling the piece Christianity is Stupid. Uh, doesn't mean we were saying it stupid. The Reverend was saying it. Um, and in this particular case, we don't really back up the argument with anything. It just, there it is. It's just laid out for you. And um, many years later, uh, a film came out that kind of inspired us to revisit this work. And how many of you have seen uh, 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 that Australian fellow Mel's uh, movie, uh, Passion of the uh, Christ? You're a bunch of godless, lefty, <laughs> cyber, whatever you are. Yeah, I knew it. Well, I've watched the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, when it came out, I, I was thinking, wow, how many movies have been made about the life of Jesus Christ? Well, of course, it's one of the first uh, f f narrative features ever made back in 19, I think, 14, 1912. Um, and we got a subscription to uh, Netflix, and we got every single movie that had ever been made, of, of, of every Jesus bio flick, and my friend knew how to crack the encryption software on the DVD, so we, 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 we lifted all this, every, you know, every Jesus movie has the same scenes of him being beaten, whipped, flogged. There's always this shot where he's carrying a cross on his shoulder and he stumbles and falls, you know, this kind of... <laughs> every, every one of those movies has that shot. And, um, so we decided to kind of create this montage out of that and sort of edit it in the order of the Stations of the Cross and edit it kind of like an early 80s rock video so that everything's on the beat. You know how they, that's how they did it? So every, you know, every, when the nail's being hammered in, like this. Um, that was fun. And, uh, and then we had to find footage of, for the communism is good part and we actually found footage of Khrushchev uh, playing badminton, uh, Lenin petting a cat, uh, Mao Zedong, you know, happily waving to his minions, and uh, uh, Brezhnev bear-hugging a cosmonaut, uh, stuff like that, happy, happy communists, and sort of put this all together, and yeah, if there is a hell, I felt like, well, this is it, I'm definitely going there for making this piece, this is bad. Um, so that's the next thing I want to show you, and in honor of our friend Mel's movie, we changed the title a little bit, but that's, uh, let's see what you think about this.
Also, I think, I'm, I'm going to guess a lot of people in this room create stuff themselves. And I think that uh, yeah, a lot of times the act of making something is asking questions. What would it look like if I edited together every Jesus bioflick movie ever made into a, you know, what, and, and then the result, you know, the work is the answer to the question. Um, and it's coming up with good questions, but also I, I think in my case I see a lot of times what the, the, there's a good, what, there's what seems like a good question to start with, but then somehow you realize that's not as, int you, you get part way in and you realize actually there's this other question that's more interesting than that, and that was good as a starting place, but you suddenly maybe abandon ship and go a different direction because something else presents itself. Um, and that certainly came true for Negative Land, where we had to, we had to course correct in many interesting ways, um, uh, especially to do with this song. Um, this, uh, our first three records we put out all on our own. We learned a lot about how to you know, make and, and manufacture and distribute and promote our own records. But we also learned we pretty much hated running a record label. It's kind of awful. And um, we ended up working with a record label in Los Angeles called SST Records for a few years, and they put out this record of ours called Escape from Noise. I don't know if any of you heard it, a few of you. And um, um, this piece, Christianity Stupid, was on there. To our shock, 
the record became kind of a college radio hit. It went into heavy rotation all over the country for about six months on all these stations. Up until then, Negative Land had played occasionally live in the Bay Area, but we'd never toured. So we were thinking, maybe we, okay, we, you know, we've always wanted a tour. We weren't expecting to make money, but we thought, okay, there's enough interest in our work that maybe we can go out and we could take time off from our jobs and at least break even. So we arranged a whole tour and um, it very quickly became apparent as the shows were coming together that we were going to lose so much money that we couldn't afford to do it and we were going to actually have to cancel the tour. Um, well, <clears throat> as you could see from the work I'm showing you, you know, we're increasingly, as, as we're reusing this media around us and asking questions of why are we doing it, what are we making by using this stuff, we're increasingly interested in how the media itself operates. You know, it's just inevitably arising in, in, by doing this type of exploration. And, Richard in our, our group, he was working at his all his graveyard shift security uh, guard uh, job, and he saw a newspaper article for, that in the New York Times that said that in Rochester, Minnesota, a teenage boy in the middle of the night had taken an axe and chopped up his mother, uh, father, brother, and sister, a massacre, and that they were a devoutly religious family. There was some suggestions of arguments over religion or something and Richard who has a really dark kind of fucked up sense of humor and he was really bored at his job he sits there and he starts writing a, a press release for you know for immediate release a negative land have been asked by federal authorities to cancel a long planned 17 city tour pending an investigation into a possible connection between the quadruple axe murders in Rochester Minnesota and their song Christianity is stupid and uh, went on from there to you know, talk about what they were, uh, subliminal messages, backwards masking, a religious argument, and the federal authorities didn't know. Well, he showed this to the group, we all kind of nervously laughed like you just did, and, and then, um, we, we, then we said, well, you know, actually, the truth, this is a lot more interesting than the truth, and we are really interested in how the media works, so why don't we put this out and just see what happens? You know, instead of just making work responding to the media, let's stick our own something into the meat grind, the media meat grinder and see what it does. Now, this is before the internet, right? So I think this would have all been found out like that. Couldn't do this in this day and age. But um, um, it went out and within a month, a zine, some of you know what zines are, right? Or were, right? There was a zine in California, and it, um, yeah, it's interesting how much, you know, you can see how these things, that, these interesting things can sometimes arise out of very specific time, space, technologically intersections that don't exist anymore. Anyway, um, yes, a zine wrote about it and reproduced the press release kind of verbatim. Something I've learned from doing this now over the years is that uh, journalists are either lazy or really, really busy, and so the more you do their job for them when you write a press release and you write it like an article, they just lift, you know, all kinds of stuff from it. So, good tip, if you need to know that, if you don't already know. And um, anyway, it appeared in this zine, and then there was a, a California-based arts and entertainment magazine, long gone now, it was called BAM, and they wrote a big feature on the whole thing. And we talked to them, and we said, we, how could it be true? How could murder, music have anything to do with murders? It has to be a hoax, this is ridiculous, you know. Uh, and they ran a whole um, a, a feature on the whole thing. So we thought, well, wow, this is getting interesting. But then, and at that point, we actually said, maybe we shouldn't talk to the media anymore. We should just let it play itself out and just refuse, just see what it does, because we're interfering too much with our own experiment, right? But we broke that rule almost immediately, uh, because I, I, I was working as a preschool teacher, and... See, whenever I tell this story, everyone, why is that funny? I don't know why that's funny. I don't know why that's funny. I'm actually really, I'm actually good, really good with kids. Actually, if you know any of our work, there's a, a one of our records has a, a recording of a little girl singing Over the Rainbow with the hiccups. It's adorable. It's so cute. Anyway, that's on, you know, that came from me taking a tape recorder to work. Um, so, anyway, they came and knocked on the door of the classroom, you know, and they said, Mark, uh, come over here, there's a call from a, a CBS news guy who wants to talk to you. What is that about? You know, and I've said, I, I, I don't have no idea. Uh, but of course, I knew what it had to be about. And I went up to the off main office, luckily no one was in there, and it was KPIX, Channel 5, Evening Eyewitness News. It was the CBS News affiliate in the San Francisco Bay Area. They had seen the, uh, the BAM Magazine article, so they knew this had to be true. And they wanted to talk to us about, about this story. And I'm, 
sitting there thinking, oh my God, I've never quite been in this position before. What do I do? How do I handle it? How do I play this guy? I, and I, I luckily chose the right response. I said, I said, oh, no, 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 we don't want to talk to you. We, we, we're being accused of just trying to use this to publicize our group, and our life has, you know, just been horrible since this happened. You know, <laughs> we, we, we don't want to talk to you, because you're just going to sensationalize it. So this was, this was perfect, because it just, it sucked him right in, because he, he was saying, oh, no, no, you know, we're, we're the news, we're objective, you know, we're, we're, uh, we, we want to tell your side of the story, you know, and, and uh, we're not going to sensationalize it, and, you know, and, you know, you can trust me, you know, I'm the media. Um, so, I reluctantly agreed that we would talk to them, right? And uh, so I hung up the phone, called up the rest of Negative Land, and I said, oh my God, you know, the, the Channel 5 Eyewitness News van is going to show up in two hours at our rehearsal studio. What the hell do you want to do, you know? And so we, we, I, we got over to the studio. We set up to kind of be like a band. Now, I don't think Negative Land actually is a band. We pretend to be one because it's an interesting way to get our work out into the world, right? And I've always liked the very egalitarian, accessible nature of music, CDs, concert halls, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's, it's cheap, and now, of course, it's free. You don't have to pay for any music. Um, so I've always, that's always had a great appeal to take a kind of an artist, intele more intellectual, artsy sort of approach, but put it out into the world in this very accessible way. Um, anyway, so we set up to kind of play for them and act like a band, and we knew they were going to want footage for color to use, you know, in the interview, and uh, they came over, and, and uh, I know when they were, um, I felt sure that they were going to make us out to be strange. And so when they were filming me playing the bass, I picked up a, a drumstick and started playing the bass guitar with a drumstick, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, well, they'll like that. It looks weird, you know. <laughs> um, and we were talking to them on camp. We, you know, you know they're going to only use a soundbite or two, right? But so we were talking to them about how the media doesn't check its facts. They're, they're, they base their news stories on other news stories. Uh, uh, um, who knows what is, you know, real, what is fiction. And... And Hal Eisner, the reporter who was there interviewing us, turned to Don Joyce of Negative Land, and he said, he said, you know, this whole thing with this, the, this whole story is so bizarre. It, it almost does seem like it's a, you know, a hoax. And there was this sort of moment where I wondered what Don was going to say, and Don looked at Hal and he said, it is a hoax. And then Don said, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So Hal was very relieved to know that he was not a hoax after all. So they went away with their footage, and we gathered around our warm TV set to, to see what was going to happen next. Well, it turned out it was a really slow news day in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we were the top story of the hour. And so I'm going to show you now what happens when you decide to do, you know, follow an impulse like this. This is the broadcast. Good evening. Topping night cast a possible link between murder and music. Music performed by a rock group right here in the Bay Area. Four members of a Midwestern family were murdered. The 16-year-old son is the prime suspect. Members of the experimental rock group Negative Land have been drawn into the case. And prosecutors won't even tell them for certain that their music, how their music might be involved. Hal Eisner has our report. It was the kind of murder case that friends and neighbors said didn't make sense. They didn't understand how an A student from a good family could murder his brother, sister, and parents with an ax. He was not a homicidal maniac. He, he was did not show any signs of wanting to hurt anyone. David Brown was accused in the multiple ax slayings, but now almost three months later, many are still wondering why. One explanation may involve a Bay Area music group called Negative Land. <laughs> Negative Land's music is highly critical of the mass media, nuclear war, and handguns. 
The group thinks their music is humorous, but they don't find it a bit funny that one of their songs poking fun of religion may have sparked a dispute among the Brahms, triggering the murders. They say federal authorities asked them to cancel a long-planned 17-city tour and eliminate live performances until the conclusion of the investigation. The probe apparently involved their song, Christianity is Stupid. It's hard to listen to the cut and not laugh. If you have any sense of humor at all, or, or uh, whatever, it's, it's, it's hard not to see the humor and, and that it would result in anything as serious as this. I think it's ridiculous. This isn't the first time controversial music has been linked to tragedy. Charles Manson said his murder spree was influenced by the Beatles' Helder Skelter. It's believed Night Stalker suspect Richard Ramirez was influenced by ACDC's Highway to Hell album. And Ozzy Osbourne's song Suicide Solution became the focal point of an actual suicide case involving a Southern California teenager. What you can say is that music is, is a bystander involved to a certain degree, but most unlikely that it generated the mayhem. If it did, there'd be a lot more mayhem around. Meanwhile, the members of Negative Land are hoping for a speedy conclusion to the Brom case in Minnesota and eventually a return to their live performances and a career that after nine years had finally taken some positive turns. But a quick end to the bizarre murder case may be in doubt. A Minnesota judge has ruled that David Brom will face trial as a juvenile. The prosecutor wants Brom tried as an adult, and he's appealing. I'm Hal Eisner, Channel 5 Eyewitness News. It'll be several months before the court decides whether to try David Brown as a juvenile or an adult. The date for his murder trial can't be set until that decision is made. That means it's also not clear how long the band will be restricted from performing. <laughs> I still can't believe we did that. Um, and uh, it's so... Of course, as I heard you reacting, one of the things that was so funny about this was that any time anyone wrote about it, uh, uh, they had to talk about the song, right? They had to use this phrase, Christianity is stupid. One of the wonderful things about what's happened with Pussy Riot in, in, in Russia is that everywhere they write about it, they have to they say the name of the band, right? It's just Pussy, 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 pussy all the time, which is just great. It's very funny. Um, so... Anyway, uh, uh, this was also, for us, a, an incredible form of self-education. You know, you start to, obviously I've watched this clip many times, and if you listen to the guy's language, he has so many caveats, you know, he's saying, apparently, they claim, they say, you know, you, I really, we all started to learn a, a, be, a, a new way to read the media. You know, when you hear that kind of language in any uh, uh, news report or read in any article, you know you're being spun. And of course, going through this, you know, we started thinking, my God, if we could get away with this, what does this say about every piece of mainstream news that I read or, you know, or, or, or see uh, out there? You know, how can we believe anything? Well, I don't think we can. Um, so this um, was broadcast all over California, and a lot of people were watching this show, including my mom and my dad. <laughs> and, and, and I got this hysterical phone call from my mother, you know, saying, Mom! Mark, Mark, oh my God, they can't pin this on you and your friends. This can't be true. You know, I'm saying, Mom, of course it's not true. We made it up. Of course they made it up. No, 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 we made it up. What do you mean? And, and <laughs> it took a long time to walk my mom through, you know, this idea that, no, we lied. The media actually is totally irresponsible. They really do base their stories on news stories, uh, uh, you know, all the time. You, you, I'm sure a lot of you know that, that there's an enormous amount of te mainstream television news which is based on video press releases. They don't say that's what they are. I'm seeing many nodding heads, yeah, you know. Um, but that, but you're, yeah, you're watching video press releases from corporations, from different uh, astroturf, uh, phony uh, movements, things like that. Um, um, uh, if you're like me, and I have enough free time, and I don't happen to have kids, I, I mean, I actually do have the time to, to read many, many different news sources on any given story to try and sort of feel like I'm getting a, a picture of what the story might be, you know, so you can, I, I go to Fox News all the time, and Al Jazeera, and CNN, and Common Dreams, and Truth Out, you know, go to all these different places. Fox is hard to read, but I do it. And, uh, um, you know, to get a sense of things, but most people don't have the time to do that, you know, understandably, and so they just get the little snippets they get from what's on the news in the background or what they see at the checkout counter at the grocery store and, you know, that's why we 
we have an electorate that doesn't even know what the hell they're voting for. Um, Anyway, so um, uh, yes, this exploded in this way. That, of course, we had we had no idea it was going to it was going to do this, but it was sure as hell interesting that it was. And the next day, because this was on the TV, we got a call from the San Francisco Chronicle, which is the daily newspaper of the San Francisco Bay Area, and they wanted to report about it because they'd seen it on TV. And Richard said, "Well, uh, no." Richard said, "We aren't talking to you," and we really didn't. We said, "We're not talking to you because we just got a rock thrown through our window." And of course, that was another lie. And that, that made it onto page three of the front page section of the paper. You know, uh, lo you know local band under house arrest, under siege. You know. um, so we're having these band meetings you know, to figure out what to do next. Now, the truth is, in case you're wondering, that as this was growing, we were becoming uncomfortable with the part of the story, which is that there really was this horrific human tragedy that we were exploiting to, to see what the media would do. You know, that part didn't interest us. We were interested just in what, how, the, you know, how the media acted, but we were uncomfortable about that aspect of it. And so we decided that the responsible thing to do, of course, was to turn all of this into one big piece of uh, conceptual art. Uh, of course, right? <laughs> And so, in honor of Hal Eisner, the reporter, uh, his promise to not sensationalize uh, the, uh, the, the, the news broadcast, we, we made a record that we, we, we dipped into our archives, a lot of things from our weekly radio show, and made a, a kind of an audio collage, sound, uh, spoken word collage piece that was all about murder, music, and the media, which we called Helter Stupid. And I ended up making a, a record album, which later came out as a CD. Um, so we learned a lot doing this, a lot, a lot, a lot. And, and, I, and I remember that um, up until this point, if we had any image at all out there in the, the, the music arts world, you know, it was of being a bunch of kind of funny, nerdy, pointy-headed guys from the suburbs who do this, you know, odd stuff. And, and now, look, we had this dark, you know. I remember after this happened, when we played live shows, we started getting kind of more of the, the Nine Inch Nails crowd, all dressed in black, and, you know, we had a dark edge now. Um, so uh, I remember thinking, well, there's no way we'll ever top that. You know, how could that be? But I was wrong. Um, we finally did tour. We played up and down the West Coast, and we played a show in Portland. And after the show, a guy came up to us and handed us a cassette. Do you remember what those are? Um, and he said, you guys, you got to hear this. You're going to love it. Now, what he had handed us was a bunch of outtakes of Top 40 DJ Casey Kasem. How many know who this is? Lots of you, you're old enough to know. That's great. Yeah, I know, when I speak sometimes to like 18, 19 year olds, I have to say, it's like the modern version, you know, he was like Ryan Seacrest or something. Because um, they don't know who he is. But he was also the voice of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> And he, he, and Shaggy, and uh, he was an animal rights activist, an anti-nuclear anti guy, interesting, interesting lefty Hollywood guy. He's actually one of the few um, folks in Hollywood who spoke out against the first invasion of Iraq in the early 90s. Anyway, Casey Kasem was having a very bad day, I guess, in the studio, and what he was doing was lots of takes. When you're the voice talent, you do a lot of takes over and over again because the engineer and the producer are going to edit it all together into the final version, right? So he's just going absolutely ballistic, apeshit, being a total asshole to the engineer. And I think the engineer's revenge was to release these tapes. Now nowadays, if this came out, it would hit the, it would hit the, you know, the internets uh, uh, right away, and it would be all over the place. And we would not have been inspired to make it. But, but part of what inspired us was to make it was one, it was pee your pants funny, and two, nobody had this. It was just hardly anyone out there had these tapes. Um, he was trying to introduce a song by a group. He got the country they're from wrong, but it was a group that I know you've heard of because they're still, they've been around as long as Negative Land has, but taken a slightly different career trajectory, and they're, no, they're called U2. Do you know them? <laughs> you do. Okay. So we thought, this is so great, you know. Also, you find these wonderful artifacts of this detritus from American... Uh, culture, and you kind of want to share them with people because they're just so astonishing, you know, and, and amazing and curious and odd. And, and, um, um, and so since he was trying to introduce a song by the band U2, we thought, well, why don't we use a U2 song a little bit? And you know how when DJs come in and they talk over the uh, instrumental opening of a song and then they drop out right as the vocal comes in? So we thought, why don't we kind of make it sound just like the beginning of a radio thing, and then it all devolves into something else. And it gradually evolved into two different versions of a U2 song that was, that was still a hit at the time that was called I Still Haven't Found 
what I'm looking for. It's now, oh, this is now old enough of a story that that song's on classic, it's a classic rock station song, but it wasn't then. And um, we actually found this kind of computer karaoke version where you could use the, the, the note data to arrange your own sounds to play the song. So we could use video game sound effects for the Edge's guitar riff and light bulb breaking instead of the drum fills, and we had fun with that. We're kind of wondering what to call it, you know. We didn't want to call it I Still Haven't Found It Looking For too long. We thought about what if we just call it U, maybe Dash 2? That's the U2 airplane, right? The band U2 doesn't have a dash. The U2 airplane, we were thinking, I still haven't found I'm looking for, and looking for things. This the U2 spy plane, you know, that kind of all went in a nice way. We found recordings of people we use in the record of people looking for things, including looking for obscenities in language, looking for things in their drawer, looking for things they lost. But in the end, um, we, um, we put the plane on the back, but we decided, wouldn't it be a fun design if we made the, the cover with the U2 really big, and negative land, really small. Can you see that? <laughs> now this is, a good, this is a good idea, right? Perhaps a risky idea, but it's a good idea. And I think that that's something that's always motivated negative land. It's like, it's like when a good idea walks into the room, you know, you just have to say, come on in. You might destroy my life, but come on in. <laughs> I think it's really important, you know, for for us as people who make art and activism and all that. You know, you gotta you gotta you gotta go with those impulses, especially the crazy ones. And um, so, so we just and we love the idea that this thing that would go into independently owned record stores and and all over the country, it's a, something that is not what it appears to be. So people are going to look at uh, look at it and like what what and have this incredibly strange encounter with a, with a, in, in a, in a, in a cons, an environment of, a consumer environment, have this weird moment that you would never think you're gonna have. We also incorrectly assumed that people would be smart enough to figure out what it was right away. Uh, so this record came out, it happened, and it really was a co and the most astonishing coincidence, truly, was that the release got delayed and delayed and delayed for just various mundane reasons. And when it finally came out, it was one month before U2's new album, Octoon Baby, was going hit to the, hit the stores. So you know how record labels release a single in advance of an album, right? I don't know if you all know this. Some of you know this. So it totally read, you know, that's the way it read, like, oh, advanced single, new you tell them, okay, great. So we heard that Tower Record like, made a huge display of it like in the front of their store. <laughs> And, and um, you know, we sent out promo copies to radio stations, and, and we heard of DJs who did play the, you know, the radio version first, and, you know, weren't too happy about that. And, um, you know, we just had such fun making this record. You know, everything we could think of that you're not supposed to do, we're, we are, we're, like, we're doing that. You know, and, and as you know, there's, you know, I love, I love art and music in all kinds of forms and genres and everything, but there is that smaller subset of people who make things who are, and, and the, the, you know, this is a big part of what Isaiah is, is all about. It's people who are drawn to doing things that you're drawn to doing them because it seems like nobody's doing this. That's precisely why it's interesting, precisely. So Negative Land certainly falls into that camp. And, um, uh, the record came out, and 10 days after it came out, we were hit with a 200-page lawsuit. And finally, we had been crushed, you know, by the, the, the man. And U2's record label, Island Records, and their publisher, Polygram, were suing us for, of course, copyright infringement, trademark infringement for using the U and the two the way we did, defamation of character for associating such terrible foul language with the clean-cut image of the band U2, <laughs> Um, when you do a cover version of a song, you, have to, you don't have to get permission to do it, but if you change the lyrics, you do. We change the lyrics. And um, so they sued us for everything you can imagine. It was Madonna's lawyer they hired, and um, um, they found, they sued us, they sued the record label we were on, SST Records, and, uh, and the shit was really hitting the fan. Um, so, um, before I go on, though, I want to actually play you a, the video we made to go along with this track I've been talking to you all about. And this is the, thing, the, the one thing I am playing for you that really, truly, honest to God, is a piece of illegal art. So don't tell anyone you saw it here. This didn't happen. Um, but this is, the, this is side B of Negative Land's U2 single. So let's look at that. Now, we're up to our long-distance dedication. 
And this one is about kids and pets and a situation that we can all understand, whether we have kids or pets or neither. It's from a man in Cincinnati, Ohio, and here's what he writes. Dear Casey, this may seem to be a strange dedication request, but I'm quite sincere, and it'll mean a lot if you play it. Recently, there was a death in our family. He was a little dog named Snuggles, but he was most certainly a part of... Let's come start again. From coming out of the record. Play the record, okay? Please. That's the letter U and the new world two. The four-man band features Adam Clayton on bass, Larry Moran on drums, Dave Evans, nicknamed the Edge on... This is bullshit. Nobody cares. These guys are from England and who gives a shit? Oh, my God. Just a lot of wasted names that don't mean diddly shit. Oh, for sure, for sure. You don't know where you're This is bullshit. This is bullshit. Like, poor Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Yeah, it is cool. Diddly shit. 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 Nobody cares. This is American Top 40. This is American Top 40. This is bullshit. This is bullshit.
concerted effort to come out of a record that isn't a fucking up-tempo record every time I do a goddamn dip dedication. It's a god last goddamn time. I want somebody to use his fucking brain to not come out of a goddamn record that is, uh, that, that's up-tempo and I gotta talk about a fucking dog dying. I gotta get the fuck to the shit. Super here again. Who knows? Let me try to sit down. This is fucking ponderous, man. Ponderous. Fucking ponderous. This is American Top 30, right here on the radio station you grew up with. Music Radio 138, all the fuck. What the fuck, Let me in here, Richard. Oh, fuck you, man. Let me in here, Richard. Man, I love you. What the shit? Oh, I'm on the side kid, though. He... He, he said shit so many times, he thought, okay, we'll just show some shit. But that one's, that got that banned on YouTube, because you can't show that kind of stuff. Um, but it was kind of funny. I was all filmed with a Super 8 camera. And I remember waiting, I was waiting for a prospective new roommate to come over and thinking, I hope I get this shot finished before they come over with the camera position over the toilet. Are they gonna, they're going to be too scared to move in with me. Um, anyway, I think that... Something that I think is so interesting about collage is how much the meaning is made in your brain about what we're doing. Because you don't know why we pick something, you know. Did we pick it because it's funny, creepy, smart, because we agree with it, disagree with it, it's humorous, it's poignant, it's hilarious, it's tragic, it's sad. Usually for Negative Land, if it's three, four, or five of those things all at the same time, those are the things we're, we're, you know, we're drawn to. We're drawn to the textures and the timbres of the things we find, not just the, the, the content. Um, it, it continues to be a very, very uh, interesting way to work. And f here we were finally being financially and legally hammered because of following these creative impulses. Now, we'd always known that we were skirting the edge of legality and doing it. Um, that, that was part of the appeal. But we also thought, uh, you know, naively, that we would just be ignored because we're just a tiny little nothing. You know, we, our records sell in the thousands, you know, not the millions. And uh, um, we really didn't anticipate something this major. We figured that if they were going to threaten us, they'd send a scary letter, one of those fake cease and, you know, cease and desist sounding letters that they're huffing and puffing and you better pull this or we're going to nail you. And then we would have decided what to do next. Instead, what we got was the lawsuit. They'd already gone to the judge. They'd already gone to court. Um, and, of course, we felt... You know, this was, this was, I don't know, our come to Jesus moment or something where we, we, we really had to look at everything we were doing, every aspect of how we worked and say, well, is this, do we want to keep fighting? This is now a fight, a real fight for our, for our creative lives if we want to keep working this way. So what do we want to do? We actually, we luckily all agreed that we're, we're going to fight these guys. And in fact, because of what we'd been through with the axe murder hoax, we realized this is sort of horrific, but actually this is amazing because they've handed us an incredible opportunity to talk about this in a big way because U2, in 19, this is back in 1991, U2 is the largest rock band on the planet Earth. And we were, felt like we're the canary in the coal mine. These issues about who owns ideas and intellectual property, there was something called electronic bulletin boards, right? Clearly, with Moore's Law and all that, the speed of computing, you know, we could tell that, you know, within a decade, there would be computers in most homes in America, the speed of computing would be so fast that, of course, people are going to get whole movies and songs, and these debates, which seem arcane and esoteric and all on the fringe, are going to really become mainstream. The shit will hit the fan. And um, so at that point, we'd only been hearing from very conservative viewpoints, uh, managers and lawyers and all that, and we were saying, look, you know, at, for us, an obvious argument. Look, if you're making anything creative, what else can you possibly respond to except the world you live in? Well, what's the world we live in? Well, it's not just birds and mountains and, and sky and trees. It's advertisements. It's pop songs. It's noise. It's, it's media everywhere, obviously. So you're saying you privately own all that and that's off limits? Like, are you nuts? You know, did you ask my permission to put up that stupid Pepsi billboard, you know, in the middle of the landscape? No, you didn't. I'm not going to ask your permission to take it from you. Um, I think this is a pretty obvious argument, I'm sure, to most people in this room. But, but at that point, that time, we felt that we had this amazing opportunity to make that argument because the news media, in its pretending to be objective, would have to present our side, at least sort of. And we could talk about this larger issue about the corporate, you know, 
control and privatization of absolutely everything and how this was having some really uh, dangerous effects. And that's just in the arts. I mean, if you look at how intellectual property issues are, you know, applied within medicine. If you can, if you could invent a drug that cures AIDS and claim, uh, you know, charge enormous amounts of money for it when it actually costs you pennies to manufacture, but you can do that because of the way the intellectual property laws are rigged, well, there's a moral problem there, you know, because the, the lives are at stake that are more important than your, your profit. That's not quite how America works, unfortunately, so it's a problem. Um, so, we, um, we, ended up, we ended up publishing a book that documented the whole crazy story. See, this is all an infomercial. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, it, it actually tells the story using the actual stuff. It's all the behind the scenes dirt that you, 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 um, you're never supposed to see. It's the actual lawsuits, the press releases, the faxes, the phone calls, all, the, all this stuff. Um, we, you know, we ended up hearing from uh, U2's producer, Brian Eno. Um, we ended up with an uh, overzealous fan of ours getting a hold of Casey Kasem's home phone number and leaving threatening messages on his, on his uh, home phone over some of, the, uh, some of these issues. And, and, in, and Casey called federal authorities and we got investigated by the FBI for real. Um, and that's all in here. Uh, we managed to trick the Edge, U2's guitarist, into an interview. We, were we said we were working for Mondo 2000 magazine and, and revealed halfway through the interview who we actually were. Um, that's all in here too. A lot of, lot of, lot of really funny stuff. But we, we also felt that that there was a way. I guess that's what I didn't quite finish saying was that there was a way that when you collage things together, you know, in the end, it, it really. I think it. I feel like it's very respectful of the audience because you really get to sort of get everyone's perspective and you can draw your own conclusions about these issues. Um, and uh, uh, that thing ended up being uh, used as a has been used as a college textbook a lot too, which has been you know incredibly. Uh, uh, gratifying for us. So um, I'm going to show you one last video and then we'll go to some Q&A. Yeah. Um, in that book we made an audio collage about audio collage. Getting very meta here. And, um, and so we decided that since the book which is called Fair Use, the story of the letter U and the numeral 2 and it has the fair use provisions and the copyright uh, act is in the front of the book and we thought, what better place, what perhaps we hope safer place to actually appropriate from people like, say, Walt Disney. And so we ended up finding this song from Walt Disney's The Little Mermaid. And of course, Disney's made an empire on reusing intellectual property that's, that isn't in copyright. You know, if the, if the, if, if we had intellectual property laws hundreds of years ago the way we do now, then the estate of, you know, Hans Christian Andersen would be suing them, you know, for, for making the, their, their movies. Um, did you know that our national anthem, it, the melody, is stolen from an English drinking song? How many of you know that? You people are so smart. That's, I couldn't believe that when I found that out. Like, wow, oh my God, basis of our country, thievery. Um, so, um, uh, where was I? Oh, so anyway, yes, we wanted to use this Little Mermaid song. If you know it, could you join with me? Um, look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm a girl? A girl who has, you know it, everything. If I'm doing this talk to 20-year-olds, they all know it. <laughs> you would have been more impressed. The whole audience would join in. Anyway, um, Yes, so we felt just like Ariel the Little Mermaid. This stuff is just neat. We want to use it and do things with it and make things out of it. And so we ended up using the Little Mermaid. We had a recording of a friend of a friend of ours being threatened over the telephone by a record executive to, over, uh, to be, he was going to sue, sue her. And we had a recording of that. Now, I can make a fair use claim on just about everything we appropriate, but that recording is just wiretapping. It's illegal and, you know. But no one cares about that anymore, right? Why are tapping's fine? Um, um, yeah, isn't it? God, it's a whole other conversation. I think there's something so interesting going on right now with social media, because a generation is growing up who have no notion of privacy the way most of us in the room grew up with. We have these, what are now very weird, outmoded, outdated notions of privacy that just are kind of innate and ingrained in us. But if you're growing up where you're just, you know, I remember when I first bopped around on MySpace and you'd see things like, well, this 
kid is talking about the drugs and sex they had over the weekend, just pr on a public like w place where everyone can read it, and that's just normal now. Okay, wow. So this generation isn't going to care about our government illegally wiretapping people because they all just put everything out there anyway. Um, sorry, that's just a strange aside, but. Um, Anyway, so we use uh, our, uh, Disney's A Little Mermaid. Yes, we were using a recording of this record executive threatening to sue someone. We had summing an, a source from a TV episode of a show called Wise Guy that was about the music industry. We used some chunks of a Dean Martin song, and it morphs into a cover version of Black Flag, which was a punk rock band, and SST Records, the record label we were on that put out the U2 record, was founded by the guitarist of Black Flag, who ended up also suing us. I forgot to mention that we not only got sued for putting out the record, but we got sued for putting out a magazine that was about being sued for putting out the record. <laughs> That's when it got really exciting. Um, and um, so we thought in honor of, of Mr. Greg Ginn, who sued us, we, would, we'd cover, we, did, we did a cover version of the Black Flag punk rock song, Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. Some of you may know it. And it all turned and morphed into a little audio piece we called Gimme the Mermaid. We then, we then met an animator in Los Angeles who was a fan of our work, who has since become a satellite member of our group. We've worked with him a lot. His name is Tim Maloney, and Tim worked for Disney at the time in the building where they were doing Little Mermaid animated Saturday morning cartoon show. So we said, Tim, you know how to draw the Ariel? you have access to all this amazing equipment, like, we should work together. So, <laughs> so, so this is one of my favorite shorts that we've done. This is all made on Disney's dime, without their knowledge, and generated on their computers. And uh, so please enjoy uh, uh, my final little uh, uh, showing here of Gimme the Mermaid.
gimme. I'm not I need some more. Gimme, gimme, gimme. So that's a little bit about just scratching the surface of all the crazy stuff my friends and I have been doing the last 30 years. So thank you for coming very much. And um, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Andrea Pauly and Susan Sparge and Teresa and Jenny who have all worked, uh, worked with me to get me out here. So I want to thank them very much too. Um, and uh, as I said, I'll be, doing a, a, I'll be doing a crazy noise performance thing at the somewhere inside a hotel, I guess, tomorrow. It's in your, I can't remember, the, the Franciscan or something. But I have a few minutes uh, to take some questions. And of course, also would urge you throughout the festival, you know, to pin me down and talk to me about stuff too. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, uh, I could take a few. Yes? Say something really sorry. You can say something really interesting, and then also it could be like uh, devastating to you at, at the same time. You know, whether it's you know uh, being sued or whatever. I was curious if you thought about what um, how you might reappropriate a uh, a recent uh, trailer for a movie that uh, has gotten a lot of attention in the Middle East. Too obvious. <laughs> We actually do have these discussions where we think about our work being somewhat, to be not too time specific. It's like for years, you know, there were eight years of people saying, God, you gotta do things, something with George Bush. He talks so slowly, he's so easy to rearrange. But actually it's just like, that's like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, <laughs> the, guy, the guy already is his, was his own walking parody. I mean, you didn't, you know, and that kind of stuff really dates horribly, so, so we, it's not something we ended up doing. The most recent really big project we did was we, we, to, we, on and off for the last five years, we toured a show called It's All in Your Head FM, and it was where we approached the subject of God, and we actually were looking at why do humans believe in God, what are the problems this is causing us, and we tried to create a show that wasn't obviously, our audience is gonna be people like you, so we're trying to say, what can we do that takes an audience like this, that is maybe not very religious, that is already intellectual, that's very left of center, and pushes them to a place that is uncomfortable and interesting and leaves them at the end of the night asking questions and thinking about stuff. So that was a really interesting challenge to pull that off. So we had to make a show that was first and foremost super challenging to us. Currently, our current performing show, which my thing tomorrow is related to, is actually pure sound. Uh, it's been confusing the hell out of our fans. Um, we've, we're using only our homemade electronic noisemakers we call boopers, which are feedback boxes, all the analog stuff. We're not interested in working with laptop, uh, laptop performances. Ah, you know, do your email, but you know. It's not, I mean, laptops are fantastic of what you can do with them, but as a performance thing, I'm, I'm utterly uninterested. I just, I wanna see people doing stuff, you know, using real things and knobs and switches and manipulating things. But um, that's just me. But yeah, anyway, our current show is, is uh, all, all boopers all the time. And, uh, uh, and completely improvised, which we've never done before either. Um, so every show is very different. So that's been scary as hell for us to do. But I think whenever you put yourself in a place where you are uncomfortable and you're kind of scared, if you're continuing to try and evolve as a, as a creative person, that's exactly where you should be. 
So, um, but yeah, that the video you mentioned is certainly really interesting stuff. <laughs> but I don't know what you could do with it. So, I'm curious how it's going to be looked at over time too, historically, or if it's a feature, right? All that's come out is this really long trailer. So, where's the feature? Is it going to come out? You know, it's got to like the, the greatest B movie ever made. Yes, Steve. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I would say probably intuitively, yes. Consciously, no. But, in, but, I, but our intuition, I mean, one of the things that happened was that when we got sued and we made this huge stink, you know, there was a lot of reasons to do it. We had our, high, we had our walk in the high road reasons to educate the public, to get a discourse going. But the, the, the selfish reasons were like, you know what? If I can't change the law, I want, the, I want Negative Land to so thoroughly embarrass and humiliate these people who sued us that we can at least carve out a space where they leave us alone. Because I want to keep making this work. I don't want to let it have a chilling effect on us. And we were very successful in doing that. Um, I've met lots of people in the mainstream music industry in the 90s that would just say, oh no, you're, you're, no one's going to touch you now. You're off limits because you don't make any money and you're just going to, if we sue you, we're just, you'll turn it into an art project. So, so, I mean, shit, when, when you, you, Island Records, we, they, we shipped them back thousands of copies of the CD and the, and, and the vinyl, and of course, everyone who worked there just took them home with them, you know. Um, so, yeah, so that was part of our idea, was that, was, and, and also we hoped that we could continue to do work that set examples, that said, look, whether you like what we're doing or not, we hope that you can see that this is interesting and, and is worth existing. You know, you don't need to, it's, it's no threat to anyone. We're not hurting anyone's bottom line, actually. That whole argument is just specious, right? So, uh, but, but, but especially with the ascendancy of girl talk and all that, that appropriation in, for, from where I'm coming from personally, I can't speak for the rest of Negative Land. We all have different ideas on this. But for me personally, it is not, is not as interesting because it's just so, it's so entered into the mainstream. And uh, those prickly, it's not it's such a prickly thing. So, um, so I guess for now it's boopers. We boop. Together we boop. Um, was there another handy hand anywhere? Yes? No? Wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes? Go ahead. One more. They knew the lyrics because of our video. That's, that's nice. Oh, that's sweet. Thanks. That's great. I love the, I like the, uh, the Little Mermaid Disney movie. I think it's great, actually. Um, Anyway, uh, um, well, okay, um, I, I think we're going to wrap it up, and there's a zillion more things to all see, say, and do at the festival. I'll see you all around, and like I said, please come up and talk to me if you want to about whatever. Thanks. Oh, wait, wait. I want to show one last funny thing. <laughs> this is a great example of... I don't even know what this is because it's not really a collage. It's all made of one single thing, just rearranged. So what is it? But you don't uh, play the track, but you're probably going to skip the track and go to the one after. Did you are, is this DVD still in there, Dominic? Yes, yeah, the next track. After this. It's really short. Oh, no, if you want to hit skip, to the, you want to hit advance to a track, you're doing fast forward. Like there's a, a track advance, chapter advance. There you go. Raindrops on kittens and schnitzel on roses. Nose cream on my nose. Whiskers and crisp eyelashes with noodles. Wild geese that fly with their wings tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Ponies and dresses and warm, warm doorbells and round raindrops. Girls with blue whiskers tied up with noodles. Wild kettles that fly with white copper wings. These are a few of my favorite things. The dog bites, the bee stings. I simply remember my favorite things. And then I feel so bad. She's sting on colored girls tied up with blue satin.
golden sashes, wild brown girls tied up in warm strings, wild wild white girls that melt into nose cream, these are a few of my favorite things. Cream on kittens, nose cream on roses, and nose creams on mittens. Bells and 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 b